Thank you so much. Thank you. It's an honor for me to be here, to be part of this meeting, a very special community. And I just want to, <clears throat> excuse me, I just want to pick up from what Maya just said, collaboration. Collaboration is key, and this is something that I'll be talking about here from a more global perspective, speaking about the um, experience of the International Neuroendocrine Cancer Alliance. So who are INCA? INCA is a non-for-profit organization made up of 20 patient groups from 17 countries worldwide. Neuroendocrine cancer is a, also a chronic disease nowadays. So our patients live with this condition for, for many years. Uh, that's why there's uh, an array of complications uh, attached to diagnosing, but also treating the disease and, and understanding it in the first place. Right, our mission, as I'm sure many of your organizations is, is of course, to, to help our communities in the best possible way. And we say that we're trying to be the global voice for net patients, which would of course imply raising awareness about the condition, securing patient access to the optimal, the best treatment that's out there, and of course, advancing net research, but with patient involvement. Uh, we do that by, by empowering our members and reaching out to other communities around the globe, which have not been organized in patient groups so far to instigate their wish to go on with that and to, to help them down their journey. Right, why are we here today? What, what really is the, the ultimate goal of advocacy, it's to make a difference, uh, to really change things for the better. Um, and we've found out, as I'm sure many of you, that it's only through hard facts and evidence that we can achieve results. So evidence-based advocacy is really the game changer nowadays. So in order to make an impact, in order to have influence, we do have to develop a compelling argument to put to the table and of course present it to the right people. And a compelling argument is based on facts and figures, reflecting the actual gaps and challenges, so one of good knowledge and competence, and backed up by the key stakeholders. And we certainly see the key stakeholders not just in the face of the patient community, but also the medical profession uh, who are our partners in this journey. Right, so why did we as Inca need to collect evidence to, to help our global community? And, and what we did to do that is something that I'm going to share with you briefly. Um, we did carry out an unmet needs in net survey whose objectives were really to increase the understanding of the perception of unmet needs that come from the different stakeholders, net patients, patient group leaders and healthcare professionals to establish this valuable evidence base on unmet needs so that we can actually build on that and as a global community identify priorities for action and change patient outcomes for the better. And of course to provide a discussion, a platform for discussion with the regulatory bodies whereupon we can address those gaps and issues. There were in-depth interviews carried out with 20 key opinion leaders, let's call them, from the patient and medical community. And that was also coupled with three types of online surveys, again, directed to the three um, singled out groups here, which would be net patients, net patient group leaders, and the healthcare professionals in the field. Uh, so there were a total of almost 440 respondents across the three groups. And I'll just go over to the more important findings that we discovered. Information, information, especially in a complicated disease as neuroendocrine cancer is obviously crucial. Unfortunately, there still is a lot of misinformation out there and there still is a somewhat poor level of, of the knowledge and understanding of the condition. One third of the patients whom we interviewed, and we have to bear in mind that actually the sample we went to is much more well connected and much more well informed than, than the regular patients because we use the network of our own constituents to reach out to the patients and patient leaders they do work with. And even in that 
case, in that sample, it was one third of the patients who said that they lacked information around diet, around symptom control, around exercise. Their needs for information on psychological care were really not met in over half of the occasions, and we do know how important psychological care is. And overall, speaking of shared decision making, which was uh, something discussed in the, in the previous session, we were said to discover that only 16% of our, again, more informed patient population can really make informed choices. There was a whole group of 84% that were hesitant about being actively involved in, in making choices about themselves or, or really being partner of the, of the medical expert down the journey. And here comes a very interesting finding with regards to the differing perceptions uh, coming from patient professional, from patients and healthcare professionals with regards to the quality of information, with regards to the level of uh, information provision. We can see that over half of the healthcare professionals are actually quite confident with informing their patients. They think they've, they've done the right job in, in getting the message through. And then there is a very, very tiny percentage of patients who are really confident, who really feel that they, they understand and they have been given the, the information tools that they need to, to be able to, to manage their condition and to, to cool down anxiety, etc. So all in all, what our survey showed actually is that 80%, uh, excuse me, 70% of net patients actually turn to patient organizations website to, to search for information. This is their main pain point of contact. Access to appropriate care is certainly a huge issue. It varies significantly across the globe, obviously. Uh, I myself am based in Bulgaria, so I'm aware of many of the challenges that were just described. Uh, I'm trying to come up here with a more global perspective, irrelevant of, of my own experience, but really looking at, at what an international organization is trying to do and how we're trying to equip our members in their own communities to change the status quo there. Uh, but all in all, the truth again is that almost Half of our patients have traveled more than 300 kilometers to, to find and look for proper care. And we all know the impact that this makes on, on the patient's life and on the family's life. So there's a lot of uh, financial and emotional stress implied, obviously. Uh, appropriate care also involves appropriate diagnostic tools and treatment tools, of course. And um, our survey showed that there is a significant shortage of the access to that, uh, especially in two occasions with regards to gallium PET and PRRT. Uh, this may not be so familiar to your community, but they are really instrumental in the uh, disease pathway of our patients. Uh, so this was again a huge challenge. And access to research and clinical trials, again, not surprisingly, we discover that uh, a lot of information is lacking uh, at those fronts. Uh, but we were actually very happy to discover that there is a shared view among healthcare professionals and net patients with regards to the lack of involvement or the insufficient level of involvement of patients in research design. And this is something that both groups agreed we should work together to change and really improve the quality of net research and clinical trials for the better. Because obviously patient and medical communities can do a lot and they can support each other to ensure that global collaboration for clinical trials is in place. This is so, so needed, especially in diseases which are more rare and uh, where there's a lot of challenges and, and not so much expertise. International data registries, this is again uh, something that um, our community has been looking at for quite some time and we know that there are a lot of uh, challenges to, to implement that but it obviously is a way to go. And more funding from governments and industry to be able to, to do our work and to, to advance this collaboration. So why should patients be 
more involved in research and what that would actually bring to the table. We think that greater involvement of patients will uh, help better and understand better how patients' priorities work and what their expectations and fears around research and clinical trials are. The considerations of the uh, individual person with regards to hopes, impacts, fears, etc. Improving communication and understanding of the research programs and their results by using lay language. Uh, I, I think that this is a common challenge. Patients tend to not understand scientific language and clinicaltrials.gov is really a very uh, hard to understand resource. So we're trying to translate this to, to the everyday language and make it usable and workable. And improving awareness of important clinical trials uh, in the patient community is of course key. So our recognized priorities for action based on this evidence that we gathered actually was that uh, patient advocates and clinical leaders should work together to improve the lives and prospects of our patients and the increasing numbers of those as data shows. And we can do that by ad advocating together for a global access to the standard of care, to the golden standard of care as we call it, including the latest technologies and diagnostic treatment tools, which are, as I said, not available in many territories. Collaborate better to ensure patient knowledge of and participation in clinical trials that matter and that really uh, are equipped with patient-centered outcomes. Secure resources and funding for patient groups to provide support and information which can empower patients to really be active partners in the treatment journey. So getting involved in the so-called results-oriented patient advocacy uh, really involves understanding the role of patient advocacy in all its dimensions. And um, as we just saw, there are many, many challenges across the territories. So you have to know your environment to, to make sure that uh, you can make uh, the, the right plan to address the gaps. You have to have established relationships with the medical societies and key opinion leaders uh, in the healthcare community, because actually uh, an argument that's jointly supported uh, resonates much better with the decision makers. Of course, knowledge of the regulatory and drug approval process in the country and understanding of the offerings and limitations that the relevant healthcare system uh, presents an understanding uh, of the power play and resilience to, to change that, let's say. So what, some of the priority actions of a successful patient advocate, uh, again, identify key influencers. Whom do I speak to to make a difference? That, that's very important. Make the mapping exercise, again, understand the environment, get the skills in place, and, and there are many uh, resources and, and courses that can help uh, improve our skills and competences as advocates. Introduce oneself and one's cause in an objective and compelling way, really. Uh, stick in the mind of, uh, of your audience and present the right information again to the right people. That, that is certainly key. So just in, in some highlights, but the profile of a successful patient advocate uh, would be someone who is really knowledgeable and competent, who is resilient, uh, not afraid to, to hear no and really um, going forward um, and searching for, for the answers and the results that should be in place. Focused, um, I would also add here very well um, connected and well respected. And continuous systemic training is, of course, something that goes hand in hand with such profile. So in summary, what we've discovered, again, uh, talking on behalf of VINCA, a global umbrella patient organization that's representing the patient communities from around the world, we, we strongly believe that it's only through effective collaboration that we can address those many gaps and challenges that we've identified out there. Um, and and we, we believe that by partnering with the medical profession and, and driving those points through, we could really um, work in synergy to, to achieve those results and speak with one voice to, to reinforce our arguments. 
um, and certainly that voice would be better heard if if it uh, speaks in in synchrony. So this really is the, the take home message from a global organization trying to equip its members to to make change. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you and welcome any questions or discussion. Thank you, Teodora, for your very nice and uh, useful.